Good day YouTube, 1MJ here and welcome back. Alright, Sunday morning here in Australia, so obviously sort of Saturday night sort of stateside, and the market is down. As to be expected, you know, there's always the, well not always, but you know, quite often, I'd say in the high 90%, there's a weekend retracement. Just generally happens and can happen anywhere from Thursday night to Sunday sort of night, slash even sort of Monday morning. And then the market, if it's going up, goes up, and if it's going down, continues to go down. And look, currently, again, we're still just ranging, so there's no real panic stations, at least for me yet. As we can see, you know, coins are sort of up over seven days, but still nothing massive. There's not been a lot of volume coming into the market. It really is just, for me, and this isn't financial advice, it's just accumulation. That's what this feels like to me. Uh, and I'll continue to accumulate, uh, particularly Bitcoin. Uh, just really always, I hardly ever not buy Bitcoin, unless it's really getting into price discovery then I'm kind of more happy to not buy it uh, once it's in all-time highs and I'll wait for uh, corrections or it to be going down to buy it. And I know that seems counterproductive counter to a lot of people. They're like, why would you buy it when it's going down? Because then it's really only got upside to go from there in the long run, not in the short term, you know, particularly in the bear market. You can see a lot of downside. But that's where the money's made. Really, just dollar cost averaging, no matter what the price is, is really the best sort of way to do it. Other than if you're, you know, some kind of savant and can really time the markets, then buy at the lows, sell at the highs, rebuy in. But there's pretty much no one that can do that exactly. Hence why dollar cost averaging is just easier. You just got to be thereabouts and you can make lots of money, let alone trying to, you know, time the market perfectly. But anyway, $1.6 trillion, so still above that $1.5 trillion, but nowhere near, I think, the two point sort of seven, possibly $2.8 trillion that I think it got to. BTC dominance sitting around 40%, ETH dominance sitting around 18%, and uh, ETH gas prices slash GUE, super cheap at the moment. I mean, 15 again. We haven't seen those prices since January, so it's been months, but look, we want them down in the single digits, and we've got to remember the reason they're low is because everything's quiet at the moment. There's not too many people getting in. Once everyone starts to get bullish again, short of ETH 2.0 coming out, and you know other things like Arbitrum and Optimism really being rolled out, those ETH prices will likely uh, kind of uh, escalate fairly quickly. But again, maybe uh, EIP uh, 1559 helps, or 1559, whatever they want to call it. We'll have to wait and see. That's yet to be determined. But moving on, let's have a look. Look, it's basically red last sort of 24 hours and last hour or so. But the last seven days haven't been too bad. So let's have a look. What's done well in the last 24 hours in the top 100? All right, AMP, Theta Fuel, Solana, a little bit of a pump there, but they've done really well over the last seven days. Uh, and then we're really into the stable coins for gains. So hardly any gains, uh, but some sort of reasonable losses there. And again, the total market cap is down, you know, nearly 6%. So that kind of stands to reason. And we've still got Sunday to come. So tomorrow could be down even more. We just really have to wait and see. All right, what's been knocked around? We know there's been hardly any gains whatsoever in the top 100. So there's probably going to be a few losers and one or two that probably got knocked around a bit. All right, Curve, there you go, Thor, Polygon continues to come down. Again, it was at like $2 something, so, you know, of course it was going to have a retracement along with everything else. Uh, Chainlink, Digibyte, Uma, The Graph, there we go, Harmony, Zilliqa, you know, Pirate Chain, lots of sort of, you know, it, it's going to sound funny when I say this, but reasonable uh, losses, <laughs> and reasonable as in they're not awful, not reasonably good, they're just not, you know, awful. So pretty stock standard kind of gains, uh, sorry, losses. So again, it's that 15% rule for me in a bull market anyway, and I would still believe we're in a bull market. There's nothing that's really made me think we're not yet. Uh, it's just a retest uh, of, you know, the bottom channel at the moment. So... Uh, very little gains uh, and, you know, 10% on average sort of losses, you know, uh, in these kind of top ones. And then again, the average will be 5.7% uh, losses across the uh, entire market. Uh, so, yeah, not much we can do about that. It is what it is. But let's go have a look at the chart. And this what uh, continues to give me, you know, hope that we're still in a bull market. Because, again, I've shown this before plenty of times. 
This is the channel, and really, that's from the peak low. We are still in this channel, and all that it is, is we're like we were down the bottom here, except for we had this big, long consolidation period before we blew out of the channel to the upside, and now we're simply coming back down and retesting the low side of this channel. So that's all that's happening at the moment. We can see we had a fake out, and I said days ago, I expect there to be fake outs both to the upside and the downside. And at the moment, all that's happened is we've fallen back in this uh, wedge here, but also we're coming down and sort of testing the bottom of this channel. So we could travel in this channel for quite some time, and really what I probably need to do is increase this channel. Hopefully this won't wreck it. Uh, it does that sometimes. So let's just try and... That's still generally all right. No, we need to fix this up here. All right, there we go. That's roughly that whole entire move. All right, there we go. So how we can... Sorry, bring that in. So we could just kind of range anywhere sort of between... Uh, let's just go here, sort of 43,000 all the way sort of out to, you know, basically July. And as long as we're not going sort of too low, and again, we can break outside of this to the low side. It's not the end of the world, but as long as we're really not going below 29,800 uh, and not going uh, above sort of 43,000, you know, 400, we round it off. We can just travel sideways in there for ages before we get the next leg up. But again, we can just keep sort of just, you know, again, faking to the upside, coming back down, retesting this, faking to the upside, coming back down, testing this. And again, we can fake out to the low side and really worry everyone and then come back in the way it faked out outside of this little wedge that was happening here. So again, I don't believe we're not in a bull market anymore. This is just the market got so, you know, over exuberant. And particularly when you look at it, I mean, that move from, you know, basically sort of, let's say here, all the way up to there. I mean, that's one hell of a move. Let's have a look. What was that move? 500% and it did it in a matter of months. So... That's a pretty good move, so you've got to expect that some of that is going to be brought back. You can't have these big, massive sort of moves like that. And again, it got pretty volatile in there as well. Uh, it was chopping and changing, and that is what a peak looks like, normally something like that. And then when you have that brutal correction, not so much this sort of stuff. That's generally not what a peak looks like. But look, there's no guarantees in life. We're all waiting to see. But for me, I don't think uh, we are anywhere near the peak just yet that's just me this all feels like a bit of market manipulation at the moment and this Wyckoff distribution pattern that's usually what it is it's not something that's done at the top it's something that's done to shake people out usually kind of midway or before uh, a big bull market is really going to start now not exactly before because we can see it started but when the big players start to realize all right this is really going to start to pump so they do this to you know make some money because they pump it to the upside and they're selling at the sun they're selling when it's doing this so they pump it up sell they pump it up sell they pump it up sell they pump it up and then they really dump and then when the dumps are happening they're accumulating because they know that this is getting ready to explode so again that's what i see coming you know again there is no guarantees in my life i'm not offering you financial advice I'm just going by things that I've seen, uh, and particularly when you look at the Wyckoff uh, distribution pattern. They've pumped it up uh, and dumped it, and you know they've probably you know, near doubled their Bitcoin uh, during this cycle, and maybe not doubled. Some would have doubled. Some would have tripled. I saw a thread out there where one wallet did exactly that. They manipulated the hell out of it, and they tripled their Bitcoin. For me, again, I haven't sold any Bitcoin. I've simply been acquiring Bitcoin. I did sell some Bitcoin back at 47,000. Uh, and look, that wasn't because I like to think that I'm overly smart. So around about here, I just had the feeling that we were getting near a kind of top and that I thought there would be a pullback. And I was, I was you know, I'm not going to say lucky. There was definitely some luck involved. But 
again, I just felt like things were getting a bit toppy, and I was lucky. I got you know I got to buy some at thirty nine thousand, uh, and I bought a fair bit, not a fair bit, but out of the money that I put back into it, uh, I got some more around kind of the thirty four, and even just nicked into the thirty three thousand dollar range. I got a little bit. And I'm continuing to dollar cost average into Bitcoin at the moment because if it's not at an all-time high, once it gets into all-time high uh, sort of you know range, then I'm generally happy to just let it ride and wait for a pullback before I buy in. Now that's just me, but look, sometimes things change. You know, sometimes you know the, the dollar cost average method of just constantly putting in pays off over four years. But look, I've already got a reasonable position in it. So I don't really you know, have to go chasing Bitcoin at all time highs. But if you're still trying to build a position, you really should dollar cost average for four years solid, if not more. Uh, and you know, based on previous history, now there's no guarantees in that, but you're probably going to do all right. You know, go to, uh, I think it's dcabtc.com uh, and you know, have a play around on there and you can see what dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin over periods would have done. It gives you, uh, the weeklies uh, and the time frames and things like that. And I'll probably have a look at that on tomorrow's video. We'll have a look at that together. But anyway, for me, like I said, I'm happy to dollar cost average into Bitcoin at the moment because it's under an old all time high. And I know at some stage it's going to break that. It may take me four years, but at some stage it's going to get back to there. And that's where I'm going to make those sort of massive gains because I'm buying below an old all time high. All right, moving on. So there's some very, very interesting news. So El Salvador's president submits bill to recognize Bitcoin as legal tender. So he wants to make his country the first to embrace Bitcoin as legal tender. And generally that means that they're going to be mining it uh, and having it as a, uh, a reserve store of wealth and things like that. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if this gets uh, passed. Now, the hard part is that when it dumps, they've got to hope that they, got, they are getting in at a price that it maybe never sees again. But look, either way, I think this is going to be the first of a number of countries. And it was, it was always going to be the smaller countries to do it first. They were always going to do it. But what's going to happen is particularly like if they get in now at, you know, 36,000 and it pumps to some unbelievable number, you know, 300, 400,000 and then has this big massive retracement but only comes back down to maybe 50,000 then they are way up and they will sell some along the way. <laughs> Hopefully not that silly, but it's once little, you know, sort of small micro nations do this and become, you know, they really move up the ranks uh, in terms of wealth, then all the bigger countries will start to do it. That's how this starts. This is a very brave move by El Salvador and they are one of the the micro nations in the world and they have trouble with currencies and things like that so this could be a really really good move and boost them way up in terms of you know their financial standings in the world so hopefully this pays off uh, but again i don't think they're going to be the last uh, nation to do it they just may be the first so congratulations to them and again i really do hope that this works well because bitcoin it really does help the poorer nations it'll help anyone that gets involved in my personal opinion but really, if they can get in uh, and have a good uh, store of wealth in Bitcoin based on previous history, they will probably do extremely well. So congratulations to them. All right, Jack Dorsey. So uh, Square, they're going to invest $5 million into Blockstream Bitcoin mining facility. So Jack Dorsey, I mean, he, he's, a, he's a great advocate for Bitcoin. You know, he's not too much of a hype man. You know, he definitely hypes it up a little bit. Not, you know, quite uh, as out there and crazy as uh, Max Kaiser. <laughs> but look, you know, w we need personalities in the space. And Jack Dorsey really has done a lot for Bitcoin. Now, he says here, we plan to provide public transparency by sharing project economics and knowledge we've gained from building a Bitcoin mine powered by renewable energy. So he's going to basically, you know, set one up and all the information is going to be out there and it's going to be, I think, 100% done by renewable energy. And it will basically be the platform for other companies to see how it works, how well it works. Uh, and you know the kind of profits that can be made now they're not going to be the first company other companies have done it but they haven't shared their plans publicly hence why we plan to uh, provide public transparency by showing the project economics and knowledge we've gained from building 
a Bitcoin mine powered by renewable energy. So this really will be the platform that you know other companies will use to scale off without having to pay because you can go to other Bitcoin mining companies and get their plans and that and generally you have to pay for it and they also get a percentage of uh, your mining revenue for doing things. That's a lot of the agreements that they have going on out there. So you know he's going to make it public so you know you don't have to pay for it anymore. It's just going to be out there for everyone to see. So well done to Jack Dorsey. Uh, yeah, he really is one of the, the better advocates for Bitcoin out there. He's just a very smart guy. You know, he's he's not like a crazy kind of hype man. And again, I'm not hating on Max Kaiser. I, I, I like uh, him being the hype man. But he's a bit, a bit aloof anyway. And, you know, he's fairly out there. And that can put some people off. Well, I don't mind Max Kaiser at all. But, you know, I know there's other people out there that don't think... Uh, quite so highly of him but again we need all kinds of personalities in the space unfortunately you know Elon uh, he can be both good and bad for us and, and I don't hate Elon he's you know a bit of an eccentric dude and he's kind of out there and all the rest of it but look he's allowed to be I think you know that saying with great power comes even greater responsibility I think he does need to be mindful of some of his tweets sometimes you know there's talk that maybe he's uh, hyping you know come rocket at the moment and yeah i don't know if there's any validity in that coin whatsoever and you know if he's just pumping you know random stuff he may find some legal battles in the future but i don't think he's too worried about them in all fairness he's got the money to fight anything and he'll just hire the best lawyers and probably be able to squash just about any charge brought before him so you know i guess it's great to be elon anyway moving on all right, so Alibaba and Google are among more than 300 companies seeking Singapore crypto licenses. So the Monetary Authority of Singapore, or the MAS, has received over 300 requests for payments and crypto exchange licenses, including applications from Alibaba and Google. So, I mean, these are massive, massive companies. These are behemoths. Uh, and it's not just Google, it's the actual parent company, uh, Alphabet. It just shows you where this space is going. We are so far from, you know, being at the top yet. And even if we do have a top, this space is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And yeah, if you're in at the moment, you in the future, you will be considered an early adopter. Yes, you're in when the big companies are just getting in and they're usually in long before the mainstream. And that still stands true right now because I think there's not even 2% of the population worldwide are using crypto. Uh, look, it could be a little bit more. That was uh, some old statistics I found literally from a few months ago. But I would say, you know, maybe if, if you know, we've doubled in that time, then it would be 5%. But I know it's still a very small percent. We haven't even got the, you know, the big businesses in yet. We've got some. But it's not like every big company out there has Bitcoin on their balance sheet yet. That's how uh, early we are. Because eventually, if Bitcoin takes off, like I think it will, that is what will happen. Every company will have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And then probably some Ethereum and some other coins as well. That is the future that's coming uh, for cryptocurrencies. Now, it's just, you know, we can't put our hand on our heart and say it is going to be these coins but I fundamentally 100% believe cryptocurrencies are here to stay and Bitcoin is the base of that. I don't think that will be going anywhere. Outside of that, uh, I'm fairly certain uh, Ethereum, but really outside of Ethereum, it's very, very hard to say. And even Ethereum, I'm not 100% sure on because I haven't seen ETH 2.0 fully rolled out. Once that's rolled out and we know that it works and there's no bugs in the system and that, then I would probably go and say yes, but they are having you know, issues around scaling and doing it timely and other chains, Cardano and things like that are fast catching ground on them. So hopefully Ethereum scales, you know, sooner rather than later and it doesn't have any major issues. And I think if it can do that, I don't think anything will really be able to catch Ethereum after that. But, you know, who knows? We'll have to wait and see. There's no guarantees on anything. All right, moving on. So Texas Governor Greg Abbott R signed the law signed into a law, sorry, signed into a law, a measure, that doesn't sound right, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a law measuring, God, this makes no sense, signed a law measuring, uh, signed a law 
this makes no sense it's got me cre anyway creating a legal framework for cryptocurrencies and blockchain in the hopes of making his state a magnet for the industry the way wyoming has become and what miami Fran mayor francis suarez is tr is trying to do with his city so again this is starting to happen there's more and more states that are getting on board governments countries that are going to you know be putting bitcoin in their treasury and making it legal tender and all the rest of it it is just yeah i can't believe sort of how fast but how slow it's going at the same time i thought main adoption was going to come last bull cycle and i'm kind of thinking it will this time but at the same time i'm not really sure i think it still might take another cycle or two before it really is that you know mass worldwide adoption where everybody's using it i think you know we'll get that mass adoption of business uh well no actually i don't even think that i think we're still a cycle away but anyway it is good to see that it is happening and i'm sure these uh laws will get signed off you know regulation is coming and yeah i just see massive upside for this space but unfortunately it, you know the next bear market will likely shake a lot of people out last but not least all right this shows that some are already getting shaken out so olympia financial a canada-based trust company ended its plans to provide bitcoin custody service citing internal risk appetite due to current market conditions just wait they're going to get back on board in the not too distant future on april 21 when olympia's deal with knox was announced the price of bitcoin was in the mid 50 range a week after the leading cryptocurrency reached an all-time high of 64,000. Now in mid-May, the price started falling briefly, uh, falling below 30,000 in recent trading. The price of Bitcoin was at 37,000, down 3.97% uh, in the last 24 hours after Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeted a broken heart emoji implying he was, excuse me, breaking up with Bitcoin. I don't think he's going to break up with Bitcoin, but it's just... Uh, they may sell some and particularly if the price starts to go down and he's probably just you know looking to you know pump some random stuff here and there to make some money but i hope that's not the case but look this is what bitcoin does this is what the cryptocurrency markets do everyone's worried now because they've seen a 50 percent correction and they've cancelled these plans and just wait when bitcoin starts to go up and look it could be four more years away but when it does you will hear of Olympia Financial again and they'll be back saying, yep, now we're going to do it because they will likely come in when Bitcoin is back around sort of 60-something thousand dollars. That's probably what they're going to do. Uh, they, you know, old school finance just don't understand this yet and they simply can't deal with the volatile swings, not understanding that you have to be able to accept, accept those really hard lows to then be able to appreciate those really hard and you know amazing highs all right look that's it for me sunday morning not a whole lot of news out there and again we are really waiting to see what will happen but i'd love to know your thoughts down below do you think other countries are going to follow suit and who do you think the kind of big first world country is going to be that will adopt bitcoin because it'll i I see a lot of smaller company, uh, smaller nations doing this, like El Salvador and you know maybe Iran again trying to get around uh, sanctions and things like that, and Cuba, you know places like that will probably adopt it first, and then there will be big countries coming. I'd love to know who you think's next, and particularly who do you think's going to be the big first world nation to do it first? All right, do me one favor as well if you can hit that like button down below, I'd really appreciate that. All right, stay safe, be kind to one another. It's pretty hard to be on that gain train at the moment with the market down. But if you are, then congratulations to you because you've outsmarted the market. And I'll see you next time.